We are all living in the most extraordinary of times. Many Americans are living under stay-at-home orders. Many have filed for unemployment, and many are worried, if not panicking, about their investment portfolios and financial plans. Well, if you are among those wondering what to do with your money right now, I've got good news. There are at least 10 planning strategies to consider for turbulent times. Hi, I'm Bob Powell, editor of The Streets Retirement Daily, and joining me to discuss those strategies and other topics are Angie O'Leary, head of wealth planning at RBC Wealth Management, Scott Cahan, president of financial asset management, and Vicki Fillet, a financial planner with Roosevelt Wealth Management. So as we all know, uh, how investors react during periods of decline is critical to how their uh, long-term success plays out. Um, so what are some things that investors can do to strengthen their financial health during these turbulent and unprecedented times? Should they be revisiting their financial plans? Yeah, revisiting the wealth plan is really important. And we have been doing that a lot with clients, having the clients pull up their plan and, and we have it available for them digitally. But take a look at their plan maybe consider adjusting some of the goals for, for this year, especially, for example, many of our clients have a, a nice travel goal and we're gonna cut that travel goal back a bit. We're also looking at uh, recovery scenarios and modeling those into the plan. One of the things we, we do know is um, capital market assumptions are pretty conservative. In a, in a recovery scenario, we might see an increase in our returns for equities, especially. So going into that plan, through the what if and modeling in a recovery where maybe maybe we're upping the equity capital market assumptions by one percentage point. And often that means the difference from the client being outside the confidence zone with their probability of success versus being in the confidence zone. So that that brings some peace of mind to the to the client, helps us tell the story around staying the course um, and it's being well received by our clients. Yeah, and I, I would add, I mean, financial planning is the process. It's ongoing, uh, you know, not just a report. Here's the, here's a document. It's an ongoing process of figuring out your journey in life from if you want to drive from one part of the country to the other, planning that that road trip out, planning your life's journeys of buying a home, second home, uh, children's education, retirement, retirement lifestyle, and so on. Um, so it's an ongoing process. And things, you know, a pandemic or any type of uh, the Great Recession in 2007, 8, 9, you know, that, that can throw a, a kind of a, a wrench into it. But if you've done the planning properly, it usually will not impact your numbers, your success rate greatly. Uh, you may have to make some adjustments, but usually if you're doing your planning on an ongoing basis, you should be okay through this. Also, remember, clients don't open their statements in down markets. So clients aren't going to want to look at a financial plan in a down market. So if you can go to them and show them that their plan is still good, they're still going to make it, that will give them a real sense of reassurance. So the advice to review your plan is good for those for whom have a plan. <laughs> but I get lots of emails from people saying, what do I do if I don't have a plan? Thoughts for them? Yeah, it's never too late to start planning. Uh, it's important to do the planning because, you know, people say, well, I'll wait till I'll retire. So you retire at 65. And yes, you've lost opportunities of savings and things like that that you can't make up, but you still should address it. And you need to do the planning because you have many years ahead of you and identifying, going through the process and the discussions of what's important to me. You know, people don't always understand what a plan pro planning process is, but it's a conversation of figuring out your goals, your objectives. What's important to me? What what are the things that I must have? What do I want to have? What are my needs and wants? And kind of figuring that out so that you have a way of planning to reach those goals. Otherwise, you're just kind of hoping you're going to get there. It's, you know, I'll get in the car and I'll go somewhere. I hope to get the, the other coast, but I may or may not make it. The planning process, it's never too late to start it. Young entrepreneurs and millennials are a big group of people who say, I don't need a plan. I'm just starting out in life. And I like to give them my scenario. If you're building a million dollar home, do you need a plan? Of course you do. If you're building a hundred thousand dollar home, do you need a plan? Yes, you do. The bottom line is everybody needs a plan. Yeah, I'll just pile on to say that, you know, we are now living in this digital virtual world and we're doing most of our planning in, in a paperless environment. So it, 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 plays very well to be able to do it virtually um, 
when the clients are home as a couple. And we've actually been doing um, plans with prospects even. So um, this idea of being able to deliver a virtual plan um, over WebEx, uh, we're becoming very good at being able to do that. One right. other planning strategy that people have mentioned to me, especially with the market being down, is that of Roth conversions. Can you talk a, a little bit about uh, for whom this might be appropriate? Roth conversions are, are something we should definitely think about right now, especially um, if you're used to taking RMD from your IRA, this is a good opportunity to take that RMD if you don't need it for living expenses and convert it into a Roth. Um, the value of securities are lower, so you'll be able to move more securities over, and the capital appreciation that will happen in the ensuing months will be in a tax-free environment. And I, I just say it's probably never been a better time to consider it. You have uh, folks that have are going to have income disruption, so their incomes are going to be lower. You think about um, non-critical uh, care doctors. Um, some of the lawyers, dentists, all um, potentially in a lower income tax bracket. You have the repurposing of the RMD. You have the loss of the stretch IRA, which now puts people in a position where they're going to turn their um, taxable dollars over to their kids, probably at the peak of the kids' earning years. Uh, so just all of those things lining up right now and a depressed uh, market value is a great opportunity to think about a Roth conversion. And also consider that tax rates are low in future years. It's a good chance that we may see higher taxes. Um, so having that money converted now in a lower environment and down the road, you won't be paying tax on the withdrawals from an IRA it would make a lot of sense as well. So one question I'm getting from a lot of readers right now, especially retirees, is what should I be doing? Should I be looking at my sources of income? Should I be looking at my spending and expenses? What advice do you have for them? Yeah, so... What we look at, I mean, people are spending less money now than they, they normally do. Um, similar to what we saw in the Great Recession when people stopped spending, now it's even difficult to do because it's hard to spend money, but people should be looking at their spending. And what we always recommend for retirees, they should have 12 to usually up to 18 months of their expenses set aside in cash so that they can access that in periods, and then uh, when the markets go down, they're not forced to sell into it. And then what we do is we kind of replenish that bucket as the year goes on. So we know that we have enough cash there to meet your expenses uh, in retirement. And also looking at, you know, again, we're, people are spending less money right now, uh, travel in other areas, as was previously mentioned. So they may have excess money uh, more, you know, in cases like this as well. I want to reiterate what Scott said. It is so important to have an emergency fund while you're working. Well, it's equally important to have your emergency fund when you're retirement. If you're trying to take money out of an account that has been devastated by the market corrections that we've seen, it's not going to be good for you long term. Secondly, now that you have a bit more time on your hands, it's a really good time to look at your debit and credit statements. Are there any of those 995 and 1095 recurring charges that you don't know why they're there, but you haven't paid much attention to? It's a good time to get rid of those if you're not using those services anymore. Angie, any thoughts? And the only thing I'd add is that um, for maybe the wealthier clients, they're going to have a line of credit or a security-backed lending um, line of credit. That's been proven to be really valuable during this time, that, that they have that available liquidity for them during the during these, this crisis. So that's been a real popular item for our financial advisors and clients. Hmm. So many financial planners have always recommended that people have three to six months of money in an emergency fund, but this pandemic may force people to revisit those recommendations and those kinds of emergency plans. Yeah, so, you know, three to six months is a good number for most people. And in the past, we've always looked at it if you have a steady income uh, or if, you know, your, your spouse or partner has income coming in, uh, three months was enough. If you were self-employed, maybe up to six months or longer, depending on the type of business you're in. Uh, but we're rethinking that, too. You know, I think in cases like this, maybe you realize most people should have at least six months uh, of an emergency fund so that they have enough cash to get them through a longer period and also gives them a peace of mind that they've got more cash and they don't have to sell into the markets and things like that. 
Now, just echo for retirees, it's really important that they actually look at their income plan, really understand um, what their, uh, their um, what their discretionary and their um, other expenses are, and really look at how they're going to fund that. And so, we have kind of a concept of thinking about their retirement paycheck and making sure that they have enough income to cover all of their necessary expenses. That's the key. The, the non-discretionary expenses should be covered by Social Security pensions or some sort of cash flow from your account, um, dividends, interest, whatever. Cash flow for the non-discretionary expenses is the most important thing in retirement. Mm. Another um, planning strategy that has come up lately is that of tax loss harvesting. Um, is now a good time for someone to do that? And, and for whom should this be a good strategy? Yeah, it is a good time to look at, at tax loss harvesting. Um, number one, if you have already some realized gains to offset those. Um, number two, almost everybody is going to have to do some rebalancing. And third reason is just to upgrade the quality of your portfolio. So we're focused um, very much on that aspect of helping clients um, reposition their portfolio for the better going forward. It's always a good time to get rid of your bad choices. Get them out of the portfolio now, clean house, and exactly what Angie said, upgrade your portfolio to securities that are better than the ones you've gotten rid of. So another, another topic that has come up in the current pandemic is the need to review estate plans and to also review perhaps your insurance or risk management uh, coverage. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, we, we have seen, you know, people who are putting off their estate planning for a variety of reasons, uh, and many times people often do put it off, people are rushing to get this taken care of because they realize, you know, it's one thing to think I can get, you know, I can get hit by a car or something, but the pandemic is hitting a lot of people, and many people are finding here, especially in the New York area, know somebody who has been impacted by it, or maybe somebody who maybe passed away. So people are, are looking to get their estate planning done. The thing I would advise people is make sure you, you maybe want to do it quickly, but make sure it's accurate. It's reflecting your goals. Uh, have the discussions with your, your family, your planner, your attorney so that it can get done. And we're finding that attorneys are available to get this done and they've made provisions so it can be witnessed and documents can be signed. So just make sure it reflects what you want, though, and not rush through something. Also, we at Roosevelt are looking at all the beneficiaries on your account, whether it's a TOD or an IRA, making sure they're up to date and making sure you have beneficiaries on other things that people don't normally think of. Your bank account should have a beneficiary. All the beneficiary updating should be done now. This is a good time. People have a little bit more time on their hands and they can focus on it. Yeah, and I would just echo that. You know, people are at home. They're their to-do list they should be added to their to-do list and along with that pull your insurance policies out a lot of folks uh, especially the baby boomers bought that insurance when their um, when their kids were younger um, maybe there's not a, a purpose for that anymore maybe it could be repurposed into long-term care we're doing a lot of that type of work with our clients a lot of younger people think that the only life insurance they need is what's provided by their employer since you're not employed now, this is a really good time to think about the appropriate term insurance because you still have debt, you still have liabilities, and if you don't have a job, you need some sort of protection, and term insurance is cheap. So the pandemic has also, I think, uh, raised the level of interest in charitable giving at the moment. Are there certain charitable strategies uh, and family gifting opportunities that present themselves during this pandemic? Charities are hurting now. Um, this is a really good time, if you can afford it, to take two or three, three years worth of your normal charity contributions and batch it and do it this year. They need the money desperately, and it will help you with income taxes at the end of the year. And, and I'll just chime in to say, um, you know, with uh, the... CARES Act, providing taxpayers the extra $300 above the line deduction, and for um, for wealthier people who are um, itemizing to be able to have 100% of AGI, that might be a nice counterbalance to a Roth conversion where you have some taxes to pay. So we're talking about that quite a bit. Also, for some of our clients who are trying to 
um, instill caring and, and charitable giving with their kids, they're going to gift the three hundred dollars to their their kids so that they can make a donation locally um, and get that tax deduction. And one thing I would add is. In the past few years, people have been making their um, charitable contributions from their RMDs or required minimum distributions. Um, since people do not need to take their RMD this year, and if you did take it, you have 60 days, if it's been within 60 days, to put it back in and roll it back in. But bottom line is that people may be making less charitable contributions, and they don't even realize it because if they're not taking their distribution, then and th in the past they were donating it, that donation will not happen. So again, going back to what the others have said, now may be a good time to look at it and make sure you're doing it and maybe even increasing it. Hmm. For those folks who were subject to an RMD, they sometimes took advantage of the uh, Qualified Charitable Distribution or QCD. Do you still recommend that in the current environment? Um, for some clients, yes. I mean, if they're going to take their RMD, uh, but if they have outside money to give, it may be better off for them to leave the RMD alone, not take it, and then do it from the uh, other assets. And in some cases, uh, people need to take their RMDs because most of their money is in uh, their IRA or retirement accounts. What about business owners? Uh, the CARES Act has presented certain opportunities for uh, business owners uh, and other opportunities outside the CARES Act. Uh, Angie, you want to talk about some of those opportunities? The, the big item that's being talked about is the payroll protection program um, for small business clients, right, who have less than 500 employees and I, the hospitality sector has a, a per site number of employees and th those loans are um, extremely attractive, have a 1% rate. You have to work with your current banker. Um, banker will get connected with a small business association. Uh, we're talking a lot about that with our clients. Um, I have a great story there. I um, sit on the board for a charity uh, that does women's rehab, and um, some of this is actually resident rehab, and so we want to keep that organization going. So they qualified for the loan. They put the application in on Friday morning, and Saturday night they were approved. So that's going to be a real lifeline for some of these nonprofits as well. They were very, very lucky. It's a very difficult um, environment for the PPP. Um, banks have been reluctant to step to the plate. So unless you have an ongoing relationship with the bank, uh, it has been difficult for companies to get their applications submitted. Hmm. Any other planning strategies that we haven't touched upon that you think our viewers would need to know about? Yeah, well, one thing I'll mention about, um, you know, people, uh, Pay, you know, if they file the tax return, they're paying estimated taxes. Obviously, now they have until July 15th, but a lot of people have been, you know, filing all, all along. So when you're, you're paying estimated taxes or your accountant is setting that up, it's, it's going to be based on your previous year income. Now, 2019, there were a lot of capital gain distributions from investments. Uh, so one, if you're doing the tax loss harvesting, chances are in 2020, you will not have that income. Um, and also, if you were taking your RMDs, uh, that income may not be there. So you may be in a lower tax bracket or have lower income, so you may want to revisit paying the same amount of estimated taxes based on the previous year because all you're doing is giving a larger, uh, you know, tax-free loan, in a sense, to the government to get it all back next year. So you want to revisit what you're paying in estimated taxes and see if that should be adjusted at all downward. The IRS hasn't given us a ruling on that yet, so you have to be careful because they have you programmed to be giving a certain amount each uh, estimated payment, so I check with your CPA if you want to reduce it. One of the things we've been talking about with some of our wealthier clients is interfamily loans, which now have a really attractive interest rate of about 1%, just slightly below that, um, offering a great way to maybe help out families where they have an income disruption, um, that's a, another strategy that, that plays really well. That works really well for businesses too, small businesses where the um, originator, the owner has retired and moved the business on to the next generation and the next generation may not have the cash flow that the previous owner had. So Angie's suggestion is a really good for small businesses that have been moved on to the younger generation without as much cash flow as the entrepreneur who started the whole thing. Great. 
So let's turn our attention to another topic that is con of concern to many of our viewers, uh, women and wealth. As many know, women have emerged as an economic powerhouse, earning, controlling, inheriting income wealth uh, more than ever before. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what women can do to improve their financial health and protect and grow their wealth. Um, Angie, uh, RBC has put together a book, uh, Women and Wealth, and the place to start in that book is uh, a woman's personal money story. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what that is and what women should be doing to um, go on the uh, path to improving their financial health? Yeah, we've yeah. been focused on this thing we call money scripts. So the whole goal of money scripts is to get women talking more confidently about money. And we know when we interview women, um, we ask them the question, talking about money makes me, we hear all kinds of words like uncomfortable, scared, uh, talking about money is taboo, and, and we really want to change that narrative. We want it to. We want words like money. Talking about money is important. It's vital. It's necessary. And so, one of the ways that we're doing this is through these money scripts. So we'll sit down with women, in typically in a, a larger audience of ten or plus women, and we we have them really think about what is your money script? How did you grow up? What was the language in your house when you were growing up around money? Who were the influences in um, how you think about money, your parents or your teachers, or maybe it's the spouse? And then thinking about what kind of psychology is behind that? What makes you um, have a gut reaction or a, d a different type of behavior when it comes to money? It's so intertwined with everything we do. Uh, and, and get men, women talking about this. Ideally, they can articulate, you know, money scripts that, that they have come from um, and then start to develop more, more of a healthy money script or a new, a new healthy mantra. Um, in my case, I grew up with two entrepreneurs. My mother owned a restaurant. My father collected farms as a rancher. Um, and we grew up, you know, when interest rates were in 15, 16 percent. And the banker was our best friend, had him to dinner a lot. And um, we, we learned how to use credit to build wealth. My, on the opposite side, my husband grew up with uh, parents that went through the Great Depression, and they never had credit. So you can imagine what um, fun conversations we have around credit in our household as just an example. Vicki, I, I know you've had to deal with many uh, uh, women clients, and you yourself have talked about your money script to me um, uh, privately. Uh, curious for your reaction to this uh, notion of creating a script for women? Well, I started my uh, professional life in Wall Street um, several years ago, where women weren't considered um, in the same level as men. They were paid less, they got lost promotions, and we didn't have any mentors. And nobody really wanted to teach us. So that's why I think it is so very important as a financial planner to teach women how to be strong about their own financial wealth. The more women know, the stronger they are. And a lot of times they'll say to you, I don't know anything about money. Maybe not now, but you can learn. And the more you know, the stronger you are and the more successful you will be. Scott, any thoughts? Uh, yeah, I mean, we work with a lot of women clients and. You find, you know, the old example I give sometimes is uh, if, you, if you're driving in a car, a man will keep driving around because they won't stop for directions. Women will stop for directions. It, it, it's interesting because in the planning process, we find that women tend to be more engaged. They want to be educated. They want to understand the process. So they become more process oriented, more goal oriented in that way versus just looking for, you know, the best stock to buy or, you know, the, the best investment idea. So we, when we work with our women clients, and many times in a couple, uh, the, the wife is the one who's handling the finances. And again, it's looking at really a process and getting involved in the planning, uh, you know, the, the whole journey that we're, they're working towards and, and, and having the discussions of what's important. Go ahead. I was going to say there are so many women um, who are either single because they're divorced, separated, widowed, or just never got never married and they need to give we need to give them the attention that they need and deserve they are going to be the holders of wealth in the future they're the holders of wealth now and they need to be treated as such that's why i think women 
and money are a very, very important topic for all financial planning. Yeah, and, and just to add to that, I think the important thing is for any planning relationship, but really working with our women clients, it's really listening. You know, it's one thing to talk and keep talking and telling you what, what's important, but that doesn't work. You want to be able to, as a planner, listen to what they're saying, identify with that as best possible so you can figure out and talk, work together as a team to make sure that you're all going in the right direction. But listening is the key skill there. Mm. You know, it's interesting, uh, Angie, in your workbook, you mentioned this workbook, uh, I think it's number two where you talk about the starting point and identifying the expectations, the concerns, and the goals that a, a woman might have. Uh, curious if you could elaborate on that. Yeah, so um, any planning process that we do with, regardless of um, gender, is uh, we focus on those things, starting with expectations and concerns and um, then getting on to goals. And I like to do it where the woman can think about that independently of the man. And we, we find some, some pretty different um, expectations and goals. And when we compare it to, to their male counterparts, um, women tend to be more concerned, um, obviously, about their longevity. And um, then we can actually have conversations around that, like what are your, your care preferences, assuming that you're going to outlive your husband, um, which is typically, um, you know, typically what's going to happen. And we can, we can really dig into those specific concerns about how they want to be cared for during that period of their time. So that, that's a couple things that we're, we're doing in that category. Scott, Vicki, any thoughts? Absolutely. Women uh, are, are very worried about living longer and living longer by themselves. And for the most part, if they've been married, it's kind of a dual running of the household where most times the husband takes care of the finances and eliminating that and getting women involved in the finances gives them so much more strength. Even if your husband lives much longer than you do, two heads are always better than one. So that's why we encourage both parties to be involved in the financial aspects of their life. Mm. Yeah, and we'll plan out for clients, and since women you know, tend to live longer, usually to age 95, and in some cases we're going out now to age 100 uh, in our planning process to show that when you look at the numbers, you know, and you're 80 years old and 90 years old, that you're going to have enough to get through the years, and then we can start talking also about, you know, do they want to be leaving money for family or, you know, uh, legacies or whatever, but letting, you know, working with them to... So we all understand that, you know, this longevity that you will have enough money to live, assuming you live a, you know, a nice long life. And uh, many times people say, well, I'm not going to make it that long. And my response is, well, you don't know that. And let's plan. I'd rather have too much left over than not enough. And I like that, Scott, because women, women do are, are thinking philanthropic. And if they can see visually that they have enough money to last them into their late 90s, um, they're much more willing to give while they're alive. And that brings a great deal of joy to um, women. So Angie, in the workbook, you also make mention of, I'll combine these two things because I think they're very similar. One is the spending plan. I think you named it the 50, 30, 20 plan, but also the need for women to identify their expenses in retirement. Um, charitable giving may be one of them, but uh, uh, non-discretionary expenses, discretionary expenses, and, and charity, I guess, perhaps are among those things that women need to be thinking about. So we have tried to remove the word budget from our planning language. Nobody wants to do a budget, but a spending plan actually sounds a little bit better. And there's actually some um, research evidence around that in the, the field of financial psychology. So we have a spending plan. And one of the things that we tried to do in the workbook is, is um, Get women to walk through their financial plan through just short little exercises in the workbook to, to um, that expand everything. So from your spending plan to your legacy plan, um, we think when we do that, that builds a lot of confidence that the woman walks away and can start to really engage with their uh, finances in a in a more meaningful way. But this um, 50, 30. 20 plan is a great way for just them to break down their, their spending in a real um, bite-sized pieces and really look at what is, is getting spent on. What are your true 
discretionary expenses from your non-discretionary expenses. A uh, simple way to also revisit, um, as Vicki said, you know, do you know how much you're paying for subscriptions and looking at that. So revisit some of those expense categories. It's a great way to just have a punch list of, of how to look at your spending. I always say that, you know, spending and savings are two different heads of the same coin, right? You're either spending or you're saving and, and trying to get people to think through um, that aspect of it. I'd also like to mention, um, I know it's common practice for, for most planners to say, in retirement, you'll only need 70 or 80% of your spending plan that you had before retirement, because you're going to eliminate your savings in your 401k and you're going to eliminate travel. But when you retire at 65 and seven, or 70 and you're healthy and young, you want to travel, you want to do leisure, you want to renovate the kitchen, you want to buy a new car. And if you don't plan for those things early on, you will mess up your entire well-planned retirement plan. So that's why they all have to be included because it, it's very difficult for people to get a big lump sum of money and think about spending it 30 years from now. So we have to make sure that we include all those early retirement years needs in our financial plan. Yeah. And to just jump on that a little bit, you know, we look at retirement, people look at, well, when I retire, well, you have a third of your life ahead of you, possibly, if you retire at 65. So you really have to look at retirement, not as just a goal, but a stage of life, because in retirement, you will have various stages of life. And it usually takes what we find over the years, three to five years for people to really figure out their retirement lifestyle. So what they think they're going to do, that changes very quickly when you're in retirement and to figure it out. So you have the early years of retirement when you're healthy and you may spend more than you thought on entertainment and travel. The next stage uh, will be when you, you know, done traveling, you, you're tired of doing that. Uh, maybe you're going to spend more time with family, grandchildren, and the later years when you may not have the health uh, or you have more health considerations and you won't be able to travel or, or do things that you used to be able to do. So there are, you know, three distinct stages, in a sense, in retirement. And the ages, it's different for everybody because everybody's uh, health situations will be different. And many times for a couple, they may be at different stages also. One may be a younger age 80 and another one is having health issues. So that all has to be factored in. And some of it you don't know planning for retirement, but don't look at retirement as just an end goal. But there are many phases and stages during that period that you have 30, maybe 35 years ahead of you. And one of the things that we do is in their, um, in their non in their discretionary expenses, we'll model in that go, go, slow, go, no, go phase and, and gradually adjust those um, down in spending um, and provide a little bit more in the go, go phase. So that's been proven to um, have clients appreciate that as we're thinking about those three phases of retirement. So you, you mentioned couples and a question I always get from, from women in particular is, there are things that their husbands could be doing to improve their financial health um, after they become, uh, after their husbands deceased, die. And things like making sure that you maybe claim Social Security as late as possible to ensure a higher survivor's benefit, or maybe making sure that you took a joint and survivor's annuity on a defined benefit plan. It strikes me that there's more that could be done in terms of conversation or education between husbands and wives as they think about the ways in which they could very easily improve the financial health of the surviving spouse, oftentimes um, the wife. We have to look at that carefully. I mean, Social Security, we used to have the wonderful, um, you know, file and suspend, but that's been taken away from us. But that doesn't mean that you still shouldn't plan on when each individual takes their Social Security. And exactly as you said, maximizing the payments for inevitably the wife who will be the surviving one. And pension funds, all of those things should be looked at by both participants and should be a very important part of the retirement plan. Yeah, and many times, you know, there are less pensions available from, you know, corporate America, mm -hmm. but people who still have access to pensions when they retire or sometimes they're uh, municipal workers or government workers or whatever, 
uh, many times people will, you know, say, I'm going to buy the, I'm going to get the uh, highest one and then I'll buy life insurance to make up the difference. Something that you, you know, is called pension maximization. The problem we've always seen with this over the years is that more often than not, the amount of life insurance that people need to buy to, to support the surviving spouse is much more than they're buying. So often they're being, you know, they're purchasing something because they may have been sold that this is what you can do. But the reality is when you look at it and the spouse, the first spouse passes on and that then let's say in this case, the, the wife is left to have many more years ahead. The life insurance is not usually adequate to provide what the pension would have. So you have to really plan that out carefully and make sure you're making the right decisions. Angie, any thoughts? Yeah, I'll just mention that we, we talk a lot about a survivor plan and, and doing scenarios both directions. And a big part of what I what I, we're seeing with our older women clients is they have been the caregiver for their spouse for a long time and and that spouse passes away and they have real you know, real preferences around not being a burden to that next generation. So that concept of long term care um, comes up frequently, actually helping them think through uh, where they want to live. We even see um, couples going into continuous care kind of a facility or a, a establishment. And then the woman can actually leave again and become, um, you know, live in independent living or go back out into her community, closer to her community. So planning through those things and having those discussions, I think, is really important. Angie, earlier you mentioned legacy planning, and that's a topic of uh, great interest to me, not only financial legacy, but non-financial legacy. In the workbook, you talk about things like values, gifts, impact, et, et cetera. Could you describe a little bit about what uh, what's entailed in legacy planning for women that may be different from what it is for men? Yeah, you know, I start off by saying everybody has a legacy. No matter how old you are, you, you can start thinking about your legacy. And a lot of that starts with a values-based discussion about what's in, what's important from, from your legacy. Of course, you have to have your legacy house in order. You have, you know, your will and your trust and your um, medical orders in place, your, your power of attorney, super important. Um, but I, we, we find, like I mentioned before, with women – often a big part of their legacy is um, their kids and philanthropic giving. And so being able to help them think through um, what they want to do with their, their money, especially we're seeing a lot of these baby boomers who are these millionaires next door, right? And we can test out their wealth plan, um, assuming we recover, that they're going to have money beyond the, the beyond their lifetime. And, and what a great way to be able to uh, give peace of mind to um, a woman and that she can have the joy of doing some of that giving um, while she's still alive, some of that helping of the children while she's still alive. Yeah, that, that's an important one because, you know, my mother, uh, years before she passed away years ago, she always had a term. She would say she wanted she wanted to smell the roses while she was alive. And part of that was giving money to her kids when she was here rather than leaving it at the end. Uh, because that was important to her so she could, you know, enjoy giving and and helping their family. And, uh, you know, so that's always been important in our discussions with our clients, too. Bob, I'd like to talk a little bit about the uh, single woman. There's a lot of very successful single women who are either single because they chose to be or they're divorced or whatever. And sometimes they don't have children. They don't have anybody to leave their money to or their children are quite successful and don't need their money. I recently, ha I have a client, she's in her 50s, successful, she owns an apartment, she has all the retirement savings she needs. And when we talked about legacy, the poor lady was brought to tears. She has no one to leave her money to and it made her very sad. Of course, there are charities and I, we talked a lot about that. And what I tried to uh, convince her to do was Get involved in a charity where you could have a personal relationship, something like Covenant House, or something where you can feel personally connected to people, um, and therefore, they are your legacy. There are individuals that you know you will be benefiting instead of just a charity. It's important for women who don't have children, and there's a lot of them around these days. That's a great point. 
So in the remaining time that we have left, I want to broach one more subject that's of great interest to me right now, especially in light of the pandemic, and it may pertain to both women and men alike, which is longevity and the risk of outliving your assets. Um, can you talk a little bit about the various ways that people maybe should be thinking about how to manage and mitigate the risk of outliving their assets? Yeah, so um, one, of the, one of the things that we really like to focus on is that, real, that income planning, as I mentioned before, and really seeing how that plays out. And we have some great tools that can show clients exactly how much income they're going to have um, year by year. Um, and uh, much like Scott said, we're putting longevity, we're, we're lengthening the longevity part of that out. So planning for maybe five plus years um, on top of life expectancy and, and testing that out. Um, where, where we aren't um, on track, we're looking at adjustments we can make today to help boost that, lots of additional savings, cutting back on expenses, um, looking at annuities to help out is another great way. Um, and just trying to make sure that the, the, the client really sees that their expenses are going to be met um, and, and then putting a plan in place and trying to keep them on track. The key here is to convince people, convince everyone early on that savings is not a non, it's not a discretionary expense, it's a non-discretionary expense. If you start early and you start saving when you just begin working, you can get by with doing 10 or 15% of your salary. But as you get older and you haven't started your savings early enough, it requires more of your gross income to save in order to have a good retirement. So it's really, really important for us to convince people that savings is a non-discretionary expense and should be right up there on the first line of your spending pattern. Yeah, I agreed. I mean, there's so many studies and charts that show the earlier you save, it's much easier than starting later. And there's so many articles you see in numbers of people who are in their 50s who have not saved anything for the future. And, and something like what's going on now with the pandemic really, really makes it tough. Uh, but people need to start the earlier, the better. There may be times where you can't save as much, but at least start and get used to it as an expense. So uh, especially now, when I think about longevity, many much research has been produced that suggests that there are many levers that people can do to manage the risk. Um, you mentioned annuities a second ago, Angie. Uh, working longer has come up as a potential way to manage the risk, which allows someone to maybe save a bit more and reduce the time that they might be in retirement or to fund their retirement. Uh, reverse mortgages have come up as a tool that some people might consider. Any thoughts about some of these other tools that people might use to manage longevity risk? That's a really good point because the baby boomer generation, um, there are many of them that are house rich and savings poor. A reverse mortgage is going to be a very important factor for them to provide for longevity, financing, long-term care, and the reverse mortgage industry is doing a good job of trying to make the whole thing a whole lot less complicated and the costs involved with it much better. It will be, a, it's a tool that we have to include in financial planning now that was never ever thought of before. And one other thing about, I, I think you may, and we've heard this from a few people uh, already, that people may be reluctant to go into nursing homes or assisted living I mean, people have always said if they can stay in their own house, they would, but people have gone into assisted living. With what's going on with the pandemic and how hard and, and the sad stories you see with families who can't even visit their loved ones in a home or assisted living uh, and what's, you know, how, how it's impacting, you know, the people that are living there, uh, people are going to be more reluctant to want to go in that direction. And I, I know the conversations are going to be with clients as they get older, they want to plan to stay in their home. And that's going to be a bigger part. And that's where, uh, as Vicki mentioned, the reverse mortgages are going to become a big, big part of planning going forward, I think. My guests have been Angie O'Leary, Head of Wealth Planning at RBC Wealth Management, Scott Cahan, President of Financial Asset Management, and Vicki Filet, 
who's a financial planner with Roosevelt Wealth Management. I'm Bob Powell, editor of the Streets Retirement Daily. Thanks for watching our program.